audio is. Uh, please use the question function to let me know that the audio is working now. Thank you very much. I'm glad I didn't talk to myself for 15 minutes. Uh, we'll now get back underway. Thanks very much for your kindness and attention. Um, so let's get back to the matter at hand. So we're going to be talking about grading and homework. And as you can see, this is a worldwide issue from Tasmania to every state to every country that I've traveled in. Homework and grading are two of the most emotional topics out there. But in the time that we have ahead of us, we're going to see if we can resolve some of these issues in a way that will not be terribly threatening, but I hope you will find very encouraging because you've got a lot of company around the world of people who are working on these things. Um, Dan Pink has a brand new book out, When the Scientific Secrets of Perfect Timing. I think the slide speaks for itself. Math in the morning really works, and I would encourage you to consider that. Moreover, recess really works. One of the dumbest things that we do is to cancel recess in order to give kids extra, uh, extra remediation when in fact one of the best things we could do before they take uh, a state test is to give them some time outside to breathe fresh air and play. I realize that we have students who are behind. I know that we need to have uh, better and longer instruction for them, but please don't take it out of recess. Uh, it is actively harmful when we cancel that. Um, throughout today, I want you to use the question function. You can use uh, the question function or chat function, and of course, you can also contact me directly, and I'm very happy to respond to you. Uh, many of you I know are watching on computer, uh, and you're more, more than welcome to take notes uh, on the computer, but consider this interesting study, the pen is mightier than the keyboard, in which taking notes by hand winds up resulting in better retention and better understanding. Here are a few new resources that <clears throat> are out. This article hasn't been published yet, but I'm happy to share it with you. It'll be coming out in the May 2018 Educational Leadership, Restoring the Teacher Pipeline and the Profession, in which I outline basically seven things that we need to do to deal with a looming crisis in a shortage of teachers. Uh, did you know, for example, that nationwide enrollments in colleges of education down 35%, in some states down as much as 50%, we can and must do better. Then I wrote a couple of articles about grading, busting myths about grading, maybe a good conversation starter as you approach these topics with your colleagues. And with uh, Ken O'Connor and Leanne Young, what's worth fighting against in grading, just a few things that we think are really important. And of course, you can always get the complete slides from today's presentations. Now, here's an interesting new study. Just a few weeks ago, Ed Week's special report said, how do teachers learn? And if I were to tell you that professional development conferences, the, the kind of thing that we're doing right now, is literally twice as impactful as Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all the social media combined, you would have told me that I was crazy. But in fact, that is exactly what the evidence says. Yes, social media is important, research journals are important, but they trail way, way behind the face-to-face -face and virtual conferences that you and I have all the time. Uh, word of mouth with colleagues, one of the most important things we can do, and I'm going to say more about teacher leadership and how colleagues can really influence the action later on. <clears throat> then, how do teachers decide what to do? I regret, my fellow um, uh, leaders, to tell you that it's not about the principal and district leadership, as the evidence suggests. It's whether or not it is evidence-based, and that's why I'm going to spend an awful lot of time today talking about the evidence behind improved grading and homework practices. So here are the things that you can do, teachers and leaders, to influence student learning. Number one is time. We allocate time um, and we misallocate time at our peril. We allocate time when we know that if a student needs extra time on literacy, they're not going to get out of it in an extra 15 or 20 minutes a day. The schools that I see that are making dramatic progress don't hesitate to spend 120, 150, 180 minutes a day on literacy. And yes, that means they don't spend as much time on other things, but that is how they catch up in every field when they focus on literacy. They prioritize a few initiatives. One of the services that I think you might want to consider is called the implementation audit. And that just simply takes 
every single initiative, every program in the district and asks, to what extent are we really implementing this? And to what extent does it really influence student achievement? We find that the districts that focus on six or fewer priority initiatives have dramatically better gains in student achievement. Efficacy, the bone deep belief that we matter. And of course, you've read Robert Marzano's splendid work on this, John Hattie's new work on this, uh, different researchers from different perspectives, all coming to the conclusion that efficacy, the bone deep belief that we matter, one of the most important things we can do for student achievement. Communication that is clear and jargon free. And we've got to really challenge ourselves on how we communicate by one theorist to another theorist, but we fail to communicate with our com communities and with parents when we have way too much jargon going on. And finally, friends, it is our responsibility to challenge conventional wisdom by calling baloney when we see it. For example, when people tell me that writing is just so 20th century, students can make videos. Well, certainly they can make videos, but that does not relegate writing to the scrap heap of educational history. Writing both by keyboard and by pen remains one of the most important things students do. It's thinking through the end of the pen. Writing, particularly nonfiction writing, strongly associated with improvements in science, in mathematics, in social studies, and reading comprehension. Please don't uh, defer writing. Writing is one of the most important things that we can do. It is particularly helpful for second language students as well. Boys won't read books, I hear, except my friend Ray Reutzel has a splendid new article about student motivation to read. And in fact, boys will read books if, in fact, they are at the appropriate level and if they are high interest. Uh, please don't throw in the towel on boys reading books. Bless her heart, she's on the honor roll. Evidence that we're going to look at later on suggests that our girls are being rewarded uh, for schoolmanship, Andy Hargrave's terms, not necessarily for proficiency. And of course, we're told kids don't need content knowledge today, they can just Google it. And that is one of the big lies out there that I think we need to challenge. Uh, students need their critical thinking faculties, and Google is a place to start, but certainly not a place to finish. They've got to be able to identify uh, where uh, what, what the initial claim is, and then evaluate that claim against evidence. So wherever they start, then they have the obligation to identify arguments, data, facts that support that point of view and that oppose that point of view, and then draw their own conclusions. So let's talk about some new evidence. Is this stuff we're going to talk about in terms of homework and grading really effective? Brand new 2018 evidence. Mountain House High School in California, failures down 60%. And the amount of interventions that the teachers had to do down even more than that. Why? Because every day they have a success period. And if your work is squared away, you control your time, something adolescents crave. If your work is not squared away, then we intervene right now, immediately, today, to get it fixed. The real work gets done during the school day, not at home, not in after school programs, but right in the middle of the school day. The results speak for themselves. I've studied two different middle schools recently, both of which have made very strong gains with absences down, suspensions down, failures down. Why? Because they're getting the work done during the day and it, dispensing with the illusion that if a child goes home to chaos or a child goes home to inattentive parents, that that's somehow a character flaw. Yes, kids need to practice, but they need to practice during the day with your help and feedback. Even at the elementary level, absence is down dramatically and proficiency up. Why? Because they get work done during the day. There was no change in students or teachers or curriculum. You're the ones who made a difference here. Now, what's the magic formula? There is no magic formula. It's all about your professional practices. There was no program to buy. There was nothing to spend money on. It was a question of changing policy from assuming work would get done at home and then being surprised and disappointed when it didn't to getting work done during the school day. Immediate, same day or same week intervention for academic support. The sun doesn't set on Friday in these schools without everybody getting their work done. And when it comes to absences and tardiness, I'm talking about same minute intervention. 60 seconds after the tardy bell rings, people are on the phone to every single student with dramatically improved results. And of course, there is freedom. I don't want to leave the impression that teachers are micromanaged in these schools, but that is freedom within boundaries. For example, one boundary I hope you said is you don't allow corporal punishment. We used to believe in that, but we found out it just didn't work very well. In fact, it was counterproductive. 
And similarly, I'm going to ask you today to set some boundaries on grading. For example, if you want to have an improvement this year in reduced failure rates, just get rid of the average and stop punishing students in May for the sins of January and focused instead on the latest and best evidence. And go to the old fashioned four point scale. A is a four, three is a B, C is a two, D is a one, F is a zero. That's the way we've been calculating GPAs for years and stop the 100 point scale, which fundamentally doesn't make sense and is full of mathematical inaccuracies. So um, what is the primary feedback that we give students? I want you to take a minute, use your question or chat function and tell me the ways that we give students feedback and I'll reconvene us in just a couple of minutes. So very interesting series of responses here. Several of you talk about scores on tests. Many of you are talking about rubrics for performance items. And of course, many of you are talking about the way that we give grades. And all of these elements of feedback are important. And one of the things I hope you would take away from today is having confidence that although grading gets a lot of attention, and that's where we'll spend a lot of our time too, it's not the only way of giving feedback. Think of a great music teacher. Think of a great athletic coach. They give feedback all the time, minute to minute, second to second, that doesn't involve having a grade. The idea that kids will only pay attention if something is graded is oftentimes believed. It just doesn't turn out to be true. In fact, Tom Gusky's splendid research on this shows that feedback, feedback that is immediate and specific, has a greater impact on student performance, particularly than grades that are oftentimes late and mysterious. So. Let's see what we can do to explore some of these ideas. Um, what parents notice most, of course, are the grades. And what I'm gonna make a plea to you to do is to make grades as accurate and clear as possible, but don't settle for grades as the only method of feedback. Now, all of us have had frustrations with grading systems. And so I'd like you to take a few minutes thinking of your different roles as a teacher, as a student, as a parent, as an administrator, what are some of your frustrations with prevailing grading systems? Take a couple of minutes and then I'll reconvene us. Lots of frustrations with the inclusion of behavior as part of student grades. One shot and done. Grades are not a true reflection of what is being taught. Grade doesn't provide sufficient feedback. It's not tied to a growth model. I'm hearing lots and lots of frustrations about grading systems. And so friends, given these frustrations, I think this is a productive way for you to start this conversation with your colleagues the question then is, what are we going to do about it? Because most grading systems that are in place right now have literally been in place for a century. And I think it's well time that we started improving some of these. And we're going to try to have today some practical ideas on how we can make those improvements. So one way that you start the conversation is talk about what's not going to change. If the rumor gets out that because of your changes to a grading system, kids won't have 
transcripts. They won't be able to get scholarships. They won't have grades anymore. Then you're going to have pitchforks at your next board meeting. So start by talking about what doesn't change. As far as I'm concerned, you can still have A, B, C, D, F letter grades. Some people make a big point of changing to numbers or to terms. And if you want to do that, that's fine. But I really think that there are more important battles to fight. So if your culture is A, B, C, D, F, keep the A, B, C, D, F. Still have GPAs on a traditional four-point scale, 3.5, 3.6. That's what we've normally done. Seems to me to be a giant drill to go from grades to the 100-point scale, then back to the four-point scale for grades again. Just stick with the old-fashioned A is a 4, B is a 3, C is a 2, D is a 1, F is a 0. We'll still have academic honors. Now, if it were up to me, you do it the way some pretty good schools around here do it, and that is have highest, highest honors, high honors, and honors. And you do that in a completely objective way. So students know exactly what they need to do to achieve highest honors, high honors, or honors. You might have a year in which nobody gets highest honors. You might have a year in which five students get it, but it's all objective. And you dispense with the notion that 3.99995 is any different from the 3.99994. In fact, what I really worry about in the emphasis on valedictorian and salutatorian is oftentimes that's the difference between who can afford to take summer school in a college class that gets quality points and who can't and therefore has to work. Or who took an arts class that didn't have quality points and, and who avoided that. There's all this game playing. And I think you could have all the scholarship eligibility that you need, all the honors that you need, if you go to a simple highest honors, high honors, and honor system. And of course, we'll still have IEPs. I don't even know how the rumor got started that grading reform would eliminate those since it's a matter of federal law. But it's really important to talk about what's not going to change. So we're all on the same side here. You and I want students to have both academic success and personal responsibility. We want student success and failure to represent their, uh, reflect their actual work, not home factors or sympathy. And so I think a lot of people who have got their swords drawn, ready to have big fights about grading and homework, uh, don't recognize we all want the same thing. But what I think you and I have to recognize is after trying some of the punitive homework tactics for the last 50 years, and finding that student work still isn't getting done on time, student behavior still isn't where we want it to be, then we have to stop doing the same thing and expecting different results. Today, we'll talk about some different things that we can do. Now, here is an experiment you can do with your colleagues, and it really helps to get their attention. You start by asking, what's the difference between students who make high marks and low marks? That is, A's and B's versus D's and F's. Or if you're on a number system, fours and threes versus ones and twos, or whatever the difference is. And let people articulate all those uh, explanations. Well, gee, it's, it's a home environment, it's organization, it's cognitive horsepower, it's interest, it's relationship with the teacher. Let them go on and on explaining what accounts for the difference between high and low grades. Then do the following experiment. Ask them to work alone, because that's the way people do grades. And you'll see that the way that I've laid this out is, Maybe it's a letter grade on the left, maybe it's a numerical grade in the center, or maybe it's on a 100-point scale on the right. And there you see the student starting with a quiz, got a C on some homework, then missed an assignment, dropped down to a D, but got back up to a B for the midterm, missed some homework, missed a quiz, but got back to a B on some homework and did well on the final. Now, the question that you'd want to ask is, Based on what you see here, what should the student's final grade be? And I'll let you take a second to think about how you might answer that question, what the final grade should be based on this student. And then I'll tell you what more than 10,000 of your colleagues around the world have said. Okay, several of you have already submitted answers. Let's see what the big reveal is. Here is what around the world more than 10,000 teachers said. Could have been an A, that's what some of you said. Could have been a B, could have been a C, could have been a D, could have been an F, 
Now, friends, think about this. This is the same student with the same parents, the same work ethic, the same cognitive horsepower, the same organization, the same teacher relationships. Everything was the same. The only thing different was the idiosyncratic grading system of the teachers. And that is not fair. I want you to put on your parent hat for a moment. Take off your educator hat and imagine that you had triplets go into the school with the same refrigerator door and the same backpack inspections and all the good things you do for your children. And one comes home with an A, one with a C, one with an F. And you'd be asking, how in the world did they get different grades for doing very similar work? And you'd be right to ask that question, but that is what happens all the time right now. So let's talk about some positive things that we can do to improve this. Number one, we've got to change the consequences of missing and poor work. I'm not saying give up on missing work. I'm not saying give up on poor work. We need to just have consequences that work. We need to get rid of the average. The average is never the best measurement of how a student is learning. It systematically punishes kids at the end of the year for mistakes that they made early. And I'll tell you, if you want to know who your big discipline problems are going to be in the weeks ahead, in April and May of the year, it's going to be those kids who have dug a hole so deep, they know they can't get out of it. They know that this semester is toast and the average punishes them. Don't allow it. And if you've got a computer system that automatically uses the average, disable that and allow teachers to use their best professional judgment using the latest and best evidence. The zeros on a 100 point scale. Now, uh, we know that that's a mathematical distortion. After all, if an A was a 90 and a B was 80, C was 70, D was 60, but not turning work in was a zero, you'd really be having to claim that, that not turning work in was six times worse than doing it wretchedly and getting a D. I don't think anybody believes that. But moreover, when you think about the mathematical distortion here, um, ask yourself if we went back to the old fashioned four, three, two, one scale. So A is a four, B is a three, C is a two, D is a one. But what do students get if they don't turn work in? I hope you'd say a zero. I don't think any of you said, gosh, four, three, two, one, but if they don't turn work in, they should get a negative six because after all, not turning work in is six times worse than doing it wretchedly. Nobody thinks that. So the zero on a 100 point scale is just a distortion. Now, I know what some of you have done is to make the minimum score a 50. The problem is, is that that gets all kinds of criticism from the public and for parents. You're giving them 50 points for doing nothing. So just avoid that problem by going back to this old fashioned four, three, two, one, zero system. And that way, if they are unrepentant and don't turn the work in, they can get a zero, but at least it's a mathematically accurate zero. And how about instead of just punishment for late work, how about incentives for early work? Here's an experiment that you can try just in the next few weeks when you come up with your spring finals. And that is, if students get an A or a B on the early final exam, administered two weeks earlier than the regular final, then they're done and they have 10 days of freedom. Now they can't leave campus, you'll figure out things for them to do, but that sort of incentive of controlling my time versus not controlling my time is way more powerful for adolescents than is the traditional grading as punishment system. And I would also argue uh, the menu system really has promise because a lot of teachers are really tired and angry with being sandbagged, with students just resubmitting and resubmitting and resubmitting work. I think a better way is you can let them have a couple of bites at the apple, but if they're blowing the test twice or the uh, assignment, then there ought to be other ways to demonstrate proficiency. In the book Elements of Grading, I, I provide some examples of that. They can, for example, compare two maps. They can look at historical documents. They can create a board game or an electronic game. Many different ways to show that they've mastered the content than just taking the test itself. And it puts the responsibility where it belongs and that's on the student's shoulders. So if we don't get grading right, then frankly, nothing else matter, matters. It will undercut everything you do in standards, curriculum, assessment, evaluation. Grading has got to be right in order for these other things to work. So let's talk about some short-term wins. Get out of the ivory tower and let me ask you, what would your morale be like if you entered every weekend with 100% completion of homework? And what would it be like to have fewer failures and fewer repeaters. And, and can we really see improvement in the short term? Here's a school that did. Look at what happened from 385 failures to 15. 
338 suspensions to 147. They even had better attendance. And what was the magic solution? No magic solution. They just said between Monday and Thursday, that's between the student and teacher, but if work is not squared away by Friday, they go to the catch-up room where they catch up. For some kids, it's 10 or 15 minutes. For other kids, it might be an hour or two, but they don't go in to the weekend without getting their homework done. Now, as you can see on this chart, there are still some kids that it didn't work for, but it's pretty dramatic improvement. And what I also want you to notice is every time failures go down, then behavior gets better. That's the way I think we sell this to our colleagues in the classroom. So since that article was first published, schools bringing in more than a million dollars because students are moving into the district instead of moving out. <clears throat> One of the best ways I know of to improve your budget picture is to have more kids in seats and fewer kids either dropping out or moving out. Dramatic reduction in failures and the faculty morale is the best that it's ever been. Now, there are many variations on this theme, but I think all these things really come down to the same thing. Um, so we've already talked about just using traditional letter grades, A, B, C, D, F, no averages, minimize the waiting for homework. I'm gonna say more about homework in a minute and the early final exam. So let's talk about how we can make some of these changes happen. I want you to reject these notions that say, you've gotta have buy-in from everybody. Friends, on emotional issues like homework and grading, you'll never have buy-in from everybody. All you can do is try it, then see if it works in your system, and then the buy-in happens. You'll have people say, well, everybody on the coalition has gotta agree. No, they don't. You'll have a lot of people who will disagree, and you'll have people say, well, you can't do it right away because change takes five to seven years. No, it doesn't. I've already shown you example of in one semester, how schools around the country are making positive changes with minimal little changes in grading policy that have very large changes. So I want you to move away from buy-in to passion. And that is, think of Flint, Michigan. Nobody asked for buy-in on whether or not we wanted to have clean water. And I would argue that student success is a public health and safety issue. When kids are unsuccessful and ultimately drop out of school, it creates problems in healthcare, in criminal justice system, in all kinds of other areas for your community. Moving away from external studies, I'm flattered that people are willing to read some studies that I read, but I'll tell you what the best studies are, the ones you create, empiricism at the local level. And that is where teachers will say, you know, we've heard from all the experts, but I'm gonna try this with my students and see what happens. I'll tell you about a woman named Brooke who went from 28 failures down to four, same curriculum, same assessment, same everything, but because she changed her grading systems and get, got rid of the average, got rid of the 100 point scale, dramatic improvements in failure rates in a single semester. Moving away from long-term strategic plans to short-term action and away from just a focus on test score to real results. And that means the kind of results that include things like music and art and physical education and also results in terms of what you and I as educators do, the teaching and leadership action that really helps. So here are things that I think will improve the way that you make change happen. Um, teacher leadership, in fact, the book Reframing Teacher Leadership has a bunch of examples, elementary, middle, and high school, of how teachers modeled for other teachers what their success looked like. It was very, very simple. Here's my challenge, here's my intervention, Here's my results. And by virtue of sharing that on a regular basis, people believed what happened internally way more than they believed uh, outside studies. And it's the inside out change, not top down change that really worked. So if you really wanna have an idea to end this year or to start next year, think about this science fair for adults, a simple three panel display. You probably see a lot of them these time of year that the kids are doing. Panel one is the challenge. Maybe it's behavior, maybe it's math, maybe it's reading comprehension, you, you, you decide. Middle panel, what's my professional practice? What am I gonna do about it? Third panel, what are my results? Now the results might be a pre-test, post-test, but I've also seen really good examples where teachers show same student to same student writing, same student to same student math problem solving, and you can watch the impact that that teacher has had on an individual student. It is remarkable. So. I want you to think about how you can improve feedback in your system. And one of the things that we can do is provide better feedback to students. 
with fast grading. That is grading that is fair, accurate, specific, and timely. But don't stop there. We can improve our feedback to teachers. Kim Marshall's work on many observations is world class. You can see examples of how he does that for free at marshallmemo.com. And you can also see an example of a webinar that Kim and I did to show how many observations give teachers far more accurate and effective feedback. We can have feedback to administrators through executive coaching and through what I've called the leadership performance matrix, a way to help leaders become more resilient and more effective. And of course, we can have feedback to our boards and our communities by having accountability systems that are not just test scores, but represent all the things that we do. So let's think about this for a moment. What are the reasons that parents, teachers, and even some students want traditional homework? In fact, I'll bet you've heard people say, well, you know, studies show that first graders should have 10 minutes, second graders 20 minutes, third graders 30 minutes. I heard that as recently as last week, and all I can tell you is, A, that research is 35 years old, and B, it is completely discredited. It is simply not true. Why is it that we want homework? Because we want practice. But let's think about the elements of practice, rather, that really work. Great practice, gold standard practice, requires coaching and feedback in real time, just like athletic coaches and music directors provide. Gold standard practice requires differentiation. So not every student is getting the same homework, but rather they're getting homework that is right for them. When everybody does the same thing, we have some students who are bored to tears and other students who are completely overwhelmed. We need to differentiate it so it's slightly outside of the comfort zone, not just doing the same thing over and over again, but challenging students in different ways based on where they are. And all homework fails this gold standard test. The latest and best evidence from Ed Leadership in January of 2017 found the following. There is zero impact of homework in K through five. Stop assigning it. Have kids read, have kids write thank you notes, have kids just go out and play and talk to their parents, but they don't need to have the homework K through five. And the impact in six through 12 is limited. We certainly should eliminate it as part of the grade and most of it can be done in class with coaching and feedback. So I'm not saying that kids don't need practice, they do, but the best practice takes place with coaching and feedback right during the class, which means as educators, we talk less and students perform more, followed by real-time feedback and improvement right then during the class. I know what some of you are thinking, but, but we gotta get them ready for college. So the getting them ready myth is something that I think really needs to be challenged because to be sure, there are college classes that require homework, but there are a growing number of college classes that actually require mastery, not just compliance, but mastery of the subject matter, meaning that students make mistake and ask for help. And that's what I'm seeing more and more. And besides, even if they did have toxic practices in college, that doesn't justify toxic practices in high school, which doesn't justify toxic practices in middle and elementary school as well. Let's use what we know works best and that is high quality feedback, not mindless homework. So how do we find the middle ground? Number one, we've got to get it done during the school day. Number two, don't expect everybody to do the same thing. I use three column homework where I can see with one column being foundational work, the middle column being ready for today's assignment, the right hand column being things way beyond what I might've planned on. So I know who needs challenge, and who needs reinforcement before the day even starts. Eric Mazur, a physics teacher at Harvard, um, gets 100% participation, and he has students engage in authentic error, failure, disagreement. Now, what he used to do is send these dutiful students home who would no doubt come back with a completed homework assignments, all perfectly done, whether or not they did them or the roommate did them, who knows. Um, but he stopped doing that because he found students who were completing all the homework and still didn't know physics. Now everybody participates, they make mistakes in front of each other, and they argue out what the right answers ought to be. And I've seen middle school, elementary, and high school classes in the United States do the very same thing. Everybody participating, not just a few people with their hands in the air. So if we're going to focus on fewer things, then we're gonna to have to focus on fewer standards. No matter what state or jurisdiction you're from, I can promise you this, you've got too many standards. And one way that we can narrow the focus is by applying these criteria. Leverage, that is, 
I've already mentioned nonfiction writing, has leverage in many other areas, tables, charts, and graphs. You'll see it in science, in social studies, in mathematics, in expository writing. So identify those things that have leverage. Identify those areas that have endurance. You'll see the same thing cycle through again and again. Uh, for example, making a claim, supporting it with evidence, and evaluating the, the evidence uh, is one of the things that you see in many disciplines and at many grade levels clearly has endurance. And what's really essential for the next level of learning? When I see eighth grade teachers frantically trying to cover 40 things and I ask why, they say, because we got to get them ready for ninth grade. Then I ask a ninth grade teacher, what is it that they really need? You know, it's about a half a dozen things that are few and focused. And the same is true at every transition point. We really need to have better conversations about what's most essential for the next level of engagement. The last subject that I want to address is the intersection between grades and student engagement. One of the things that I'm hearing from around the country, indeed around the world, is that students are disengaged and they're even when they look like they're attentive, they're highly unengaged. They lack behavioral engagement, that is participating. They lack emotional engagement, genuine enthusiasm, and they lack cognitive engagement, curiosity. So how do we address this? Here is the most disappointing research I've seen in a long time. About three-fourths of our elementary kids are engaged at school. But look at what happens as we go through middle and through high school. We're down to fewer than a third of them being engaged by the 11th grade. And a lot of that is because they lead lives of crushing boredom. So we can do better here. And one way that we can do better is to listen to people who have followed students around, who shadowed students for two full days. And here is what this coach wrote. Students lead lives of crushing boredom. They sit 90% of the time and sitting is exhausting. Most of their time is devoted to receiving information, not discovering it. They act engaged, but they are not. So I think, friends, we can do a whole lot better by adopting these five key areas. Competence. They get good at things, and then they're more engaged. That's why they play video games, because they can get better and better all the time. Personal respect. Um, one of the things that, the, uh, that I've been noticing is the use of sarcasm and how that signals disrespect for students, and students pick up on it right away. Efficacy, the bone-deep belief that we matter. Choice, but choice within a framework. Please don't listen to those people who say, just let the students choose anything they want and then a miracle happens. Actually, sometimes students make really bad choices, including the choice to only have the path of least resistance. So what we need to do is have choice within a framework, and that will include choosing some difficult things. And of course, hope. Tomorrow's better than yesterday. Next week's going to be better than this week. When they have high levels of hope, look what happens for students. Satisfaction, self-esteem, optimism, meaning in life, happiness, all get better. And they get better with injuries, diseases, and pain. It's more important, hope is more important, than intelligence and natural ability. So I want you to think for a moment where the highest levels of engagement are in your schools. And I bet I know what you're thinking, where students have some choice, where they're active, maybe extracurricular activities, maybe it's the drama club, maybe it's the athletic team. You're right on that. Here's the results from a very large group of students. And I want you to look at this chart carefully, going from left to right. If I go after these disengaged students who are involved in nothing, zero extracurriculars, and get them involved in one or two or three, it's a rocket ship when it comes to influencing their GPA, which also is a surrogate for attendance and behavior, all manner of things. But look what happens on the right-hand side of the chart. When they go from four to five to six to seven to eight to nine, it's all just random noise. The most important thing you and I can do, therefore, is to get students who are not engaged in anything right now involved in one or two activities. And let's be really careful about those policies that say, if a student's having trouble in school, they get kicked off the team, when in fact it may be the team or the drama club or other association that is what's keeping them in school in the first place. So in sum, here are the gold standards of grading practices, uh, grades that are part of the feedback used by students and teachers to improve teaching and learning. Grades are so clear that kids can accurately predict their own grades. Don't let this semester end without, before you give grades, asking students, what do you think you're going to receive? And that'll be a test as to how clear your grading system is. 
And of course, it ought to be consistent with external assessments. I grieve every year when I see students who get high marks on college classes like AP classes and get Ds in the class for failure to comply. There ought to be consistency with external assessments and what our grades are. Now, all these things that you see before you here are variations in a the theme. I mentioned the catch-up solution. Other schools use red, yellow, green systems where they'll, if students are missing assignments, look in backpacks. Others have a quiet table at lunch. Others have coach's corner. I'm not gonna micromanage what you choose. I'm just requesting that you choose something, something that's worthy of an experiment at your school to have more work done on time and more work done at a higher quality. The last thing I'll address are the tough stuff, cheating and plagiarism. It's endemic, 20 year high Journal of Ed Psych reports. And part of the reason I don't think is because kids are less moral today, but a lot of them simply don't know what plagiarism is and we've got to teach them. I'm seeing some really great examples at the elementary level of teachers who are having students use citations really early, according to Dr. Samantha Jones in this uh, website or in this journal. They're even writing essays in third and fourth grade, learning to cite sources and learning to give credit where it's appropriate. You don't do it, we explain, because of the style manual that's gonna come along in middle and high school. You do it because you have a moral and ethical obligation to acknowledge the work of others. Group projects are tough, and that is where I would say we need to have both individual and group accountability. And of course, student sandbagging, where they just wait and wait and wait until the end of the semester to turn things in. A better approach is the menu system, where if they don't do well the first couple of times on an assessment or assignment, they choose something else from the menu. Finally, I think you're still gonna run into parent demands. Well, is my kid the best? Did my kid beat that kid? For 25 years, we've had standards in this country, and the essence of standards is that that is a question we're not going to address. We're not gonna talk about anybody else's kid, Ms. McGillicuddy, we're only gonna talk about your kid, and that means I'm gonna focus on your student's performance against an objective standard. So, um, the, um, I, I have already bumped up against the time that I promised I would end on, so I'm just going to jump to the end here and say the following. Um, if you want to have these slides or a personal conversation about these uh, subjects, you've got my telephone number down there, you've got my Twitter handle, and you can also go to creativeleadership.net. I'm more than happy to address those issues with you. With small groups, with one-on-one, -on -one, we are here to serve. Thanks very much for your kind attention today, and I hope to be hearing from you later.